So we're good to go. So um, I think we should wait a couple of minutes though, because I can see the um, viewers mm -hmm. um, and we're only at 10. And so maybe just give it a couple minutes since we kind of got it streaming light. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so one of my friends who's trying to watch it still says that it's private. Is it like limited so that it's only viewable if they registered? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Um, yeah, it should only be the, the link I got in the email reminder did not work. Hmm. Okay. I wonder if We can somehow share the link with viewers. Um, Kevin, in the comments, how did you get the, how did you end up like finding the link? Did you just go to the YouTube channel? Let me see. Okay, so yeah, if you go to the um, channel, the U Universe at Home YouTube channel, you can find it, but I don't know how to communicate that to everyone who signed up. Yeah, I'm trying to see right now. I have the zip file for, um, I know I sent Angie it this morning, so I'm wondering if I would be able to, I don't think I deleted it. Um, here we go. Let me see if I can open the CSV and try to send the file super quick to everybody if that's possible. Did you see Alex's mes message? No, I did not. Oh. Did he just send it? Yes, and that link does work. It brings you to the stream. Um, Did he just send this link to you? Um, he is in the Discord. In the Discord. Yeah. I wonder if how we can send that to everybody. Um, it's literally the exact same link as. Mike might be still tied up from his uh, midterm. That's so weird. He's taking a midterm for difficult. That's I think so it weird. I'm so confused. It's literally the exact same link as is in the email. Um,
So for those of you that are here, we're just having some technical difficulties. It seems like the wrong link got sent out to some people so they can't access the video. So we're just trying to get it up to them really quick. Yeah, that's the same link that is in the email that was sent today. Hmm. Yeah, but somehow it doesn't work when you click on it from the email, but it does when I clicked on it from the Discord. Very strange. Very strange. Hmm. I have no idea um, how that could possibly be. Let me copy the link. email it to everyone, but it might take a few minutes if we would get started or if maybe, let me check, maybe more people are finding their way if they copied and pasted it. We're at over double. Oh, here we go. Need to, oh yeah, David said need to copy paste um, the link and then it works, which is very strange. Yeah, I think we could get started and then hopefully people will be able to copy and paste the link in. Um, but yeah, that's unfortunate that it doesn't work through the email for some reason. Strange. Okay, um, I'll share my screen then. And one second. Okay. Okay, uh, can you see my screen, Anna? Yes, I can. Okay, awesome. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, so, tonight, I'm, I'm Ann Dewar. Um, so tonight, I guess, I'll be presenting on gamma ray astronomy from pulsars to supermassive black holes. Oh, I suppose I should be putting this in present mode. That's better. So let's start out with what is a gamma ray? So in simplest terms, it's a photon. And a photon is just a little packet of light. And we can see photons if they fall into a narrow band of the spectrum known as the visible, visible band. Um, these photons have wavelengths between 380 and 700 nanometers, which translates to an energy between one and four electron volts. Um, we, gamma rays are just the highest energy classification of photons. We call any photon with an energy above 100 kilo electron volts, which, which translates to 100,000 electron volts uh, to be a gamma ray. Um, so even the lowest energy um, of the gamma rays have um, over 100,000 times the energy of a visible photon. But that's just the low end of the spectrum. The highest energy gamma ray we've ever detected had an energy of 450 tera electron volts, which is 450 trillion electron volts. So that's 100 trillion times more energetic than a visible photon and four and a half billion times more energetic than the lowest energy gamma ray photon. So gamma rays represent a huge range of energy and they can tell us a whole lot about the universe. So to give you a reference um, to something physical, especially if you've been to Minnesota in the summer, um, a photon with an energy of one terabolt has the energy of about a mosquito flying at its typical speed. Um, that doesn't seem like a lot, but you have to keep in mind that the photons are massless particles. So for a massless particle to just have that much energy is insane. Um, in fact, these photons are so energetic, they will just go straight through mirrors. So if we were to set up mirrors 
um, intending to reflect gamma rays onto a detector like we would in more traditional modes of astronomy, it wouldn't work. They would just go straight through and we would see nothing. Additionally, um, gamma rays are blocked by the atmosphere. So how did we start uh, gamma ray astronomy with these photons? Um, so it starts with, I believe, the Cold War. Um, so countries were very, very worried about um, nuclear tests and um, they didn't trust other countries to notify us if they were conducting a, nu a nuclear test. So there were um, these gamma ray satellites launched to look at the earth to make sure that nothing was going boom and producing gamma rays, which nuclear bombs do. Um, so that spurred the first gamma ray detectors in space. Um, shortly after in in the 1960s, we launched Explorer 11, which detected a gamma ray background. So this is not a, a distinct source. This is just in general, when we look at the sky, we see some gamma rays. Um, the satellite OSO-3 launched in 1967 and detected a gamma ray source for the first time. Okay, I apologize because this is not my part of the presentation. Okay, so this is this is the satellite that I was talking about. So it was the VELA satellite built to detect nuclear detonations. And it found very energetic gamma ray radiation. It found bursts, which people were at first a little bit freaked out about because they were seeing gamma ray bursts. And their only idea of where this could come from was nuclear bombs. But it turns out that once they asked the scientists or the astronomers that there's something called gamma ray bursts and they're coming from outside of the galaxy. Um, and this wasn't known to the general public because of course, during the Cold War, this was classified for quite a while. Okay, so some more recent projects. Um, so there's SWIFT, which was launched in 2004 and is designed to detect gamma ray bursts. So gamma ray bursts are very, very short bursts of gamma ray radiation. Um, to, to date, it's found more than 500 gamma ray bursts and I'm not sure if it's still up. Um, yeah, uh, Fermi was launched in 2008 and it's made to kind of survey the sky. So it's got two instruments on it. One scans the sky about every day or so, um, which is great because then we kind of have a full image of the, what's going on in the gamma ray sky at any time, um, which is important for these bursts that have um, a very short length. And it's released um, a very, very cool map of the gamma ray sky. Um, you can see lots of cool stuff on that. Okay, one second. So more recently, we figured out a way to detect gamma rays from uh, the ground. And I'll go over how that works later on. Um, so the original one was Whipple. Um, I believe it was Whipple, um, which is built um, down in Arizona. It's in the same place as where the Veritas telescope is. Um, and they're specialized to observe gamma ray radiation from space. Okay, so there are some gamma ray sources on Earth. So we talked about nuclear bombs, um, but it also comes from power plants. So um, nuclear bombs kind of scatter gamma rays everywhere, which is a big issue because that radiation is dangerous to us. However, nuclear power plants, they um, make an effort to block all that radiation from getting out. So it's generally more contained and safer, which is why we can have nuclear power, power plants. Thunderstorms can also generate gamma rays, um, and it's believed to come from the intense electrical fields um, that generate lightning. Uh, there's also gamma ray sources within the galaxy, so the sun does emit some gamma rays. I am not a solar scientist, uh, so I cannot explain how it emits. Um, I believe it has something to do with the flares, though. Um, 
surprisingly, the moon is also very bright in gamma rays. Um, it's actually kind of brighter in the sky if you look at it in the gamma rays, um, not because its intrinsic emission of gamma rays is higher, but because it's so much closer than, than the sun. Um, but cosmic rays bombard it and it reproduces gamma ray radiation, which we can see. Um, there's also supernova, um, which is the explosion at the end of a star's life, um, a massive star's life to be specific. Um, and you can see that in this image on the left, um, the extreme conditions within a supernova um, create the gamma rays. Um, there's also pulsars, which you can see an example of a pulsar down here. Um, it's the famous Crab Nebula. Um, and a pulsar is a neutron star, which a neutron star is um, the leftovers of a, um, of a star after it's died that is spinning very, very rapidly and has a very um, high magnetic field, which allows it to produce the gamma rays. Um, some uh, galactic black holes can also produce gamma rays. Um, when material falls in, it can get, uh, it can go into an accretion disk and um, be spit back out and produce gamma rays. I think Anne has a better explanation of that if she is ready to take over. Yeah, hi guys. Um, thanks for all that. Um, my internet just completely went fluey, so um, I'm... Everything's fine now. Unfortunately, you know, what I'm trying to type on my phone doesn't go so great. Anyways, so yeah, um, exactly what Anne was just saying. Um, black holes, when they eat material, which is to say when they accrete things, um, they'll form an accretion disk, which is material in the process of falling onto a black hole. Um, so when we have an accretion disk, that material gets very, very energetic when it gets very, very close to the black hole. And then it emits gamma rays because gamma rays are very energetic. So yeah, again, like Andrew was saying, uh, we have a crab nebula where right here in the middle where the pulsar is, we're seeing gamma rays and they're all, you know, right close to the center. And this picture is actually taken in X-ray, but it's still a very energetic photo of a supernova remnant. It illustrates the point that a supernova being a very energetic event will produce some gamma rays. Um, and you need to, yeah, thanks. So finally, we're gonna talk about gamma ray sources outside the galaxy, which are, you know, these huge dramatic events because if it's outside of our galaxy, it's gotta be pretty bright for us to see it. So the first, um, first one is gamma ray bursts, which are some of the most energetic and least understood events we see. They are, they are bursts of gamma rays. Um, they last on the order of like a few seconds, maybe a minute. Um, the longest ever recorded one was about an hour. So they're very short and they're also incredibly energetic. When they add up all of the energy, it is, again, these are just the flat out, the most energetic events we see, which is incredible. So we see these usually from outside the galaxy and we think we might know what causes some of them. We think some of them are from supernovas and we think some of them are from like very weird pulsars doing very weird things. Uh, the other category is the other sort of main source of gamma rays from outside the galaxy is called blazars. So gamma ray bursts come from very small sources doing something very big. Blazars are very big sources. Um, a blazar is a very bright, very distant galaxy whose central supermassive black hole is eating extremely fast. Uh, excuse me. So a, every galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center. In the case of a blazar, this black hole is eating incredibly fast, which means that its accretion disk is very bright, but also that it ends up shooting out a jet. So basically it's eating, 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 but it can only eat so fast and as it tries to eat all of this stuff at once, not all of it can get into the black hole and it will shoot some of that material out along jets. So this is actually a gamma ray burst and this is a um, galaxy with jets. Uh, ah, geez, sorry, I'm so used to doing it with my own mouse. Um, so we have, <clears throat> excuse me. So again, just we have these, uh, they're very similar scenarios, but in the second one, this jet will emit very brightly in gamma rays. And if we're looking at it with the right telescopes, we can detect those gamma rays. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have about blazars, yeah. 
Take it away, Anne. Ready. Um, so as we previously mentioned, gamma rays are blocked by the atmosphere. So we obviously can't use the same method for detecting gamma rays in space as we do on ground. Um, and originally, actually, space-based gamma ray astronomy was the only option. So that's why the earlier history is space-based telescopes. Um, so some well-known observatories are Fermi, which is currently orbiting, uh, SWIFT, and the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. Um, so we have recently found out a way to detect do gamma ray astronomy from the ground. And some current examples used are Veritas, which Anne and I use in our research, Magic, S, and Hawk. Okay. So for space-based astronomy, there's two main methods. Um, the first is a scintillator detector. So a specially designed, there's a specially designed type of material. Um, and when a high energy photon enters it and travels through the material, it gives up little bits of energy along its path, which excites the atoms. Atoms are boring and they don't like to be excited. So they release the extra energy um, as a lower energy photon um, which we can detect using a photoelectric material. Uh, so photoelectric materials are material, materials that release electrons um, when they're hit by photons with the right energy range. We can just monitor the current coming out of the photoelectric material and infer that a gamma ray photon um, hit the det detector. Uh, there's also pair production detectors, which operate on a similar principle. So instead of a scintillator crystal, it's a metal metallic material this time. So gamma rays interact with the atoms in the metallic material and produce a pair of charged particles, an electron and a positron. So for those of you that might not know, um, an electron has a negative charge, has very small mass, and a positron is the same thing as an electron, but with the opposite charge. And, and we, Anne, um, yeah. Caleb in the comments was asking, what are scintillator crystals made of? If you happen to I know. do not know. I am not a material scientist, um, but they can be made of a lot of different things. Um, they can actually be liquid in some experiments, I think. Um, scintillator is kind of just a general term for um, something that exhibits this behavior. Okay. All right, so you'll notice that these um, methods are kind of indirect ways of detecting gamma rays, and this carries through to ground-based gamma ray astronomy. Okay, so ground-based gamma ray telescopes are known as imaging atmospheric Cherenkov telescopes, um, and they get their name from the Cherenkov effect, which they exploit to see these gamma ray photons. Um, so first, a gamma ray hits the atmosphere and interacts with an atom, producing a pair of charged particles. These charged particles usually exceed the, the speed of light in the atmosphere. Physics does not allow this, um, so these particles have to slam on the brakes so they're no longer going faster than the local speed of light. And they do this by um, in releasing energy in the form of blue photons. Um, and Caleb yeah. was also wondering, sorry, do the positrons come from the metal itself? No. Um, so that gets into some quantum stuff, which I am not familiar with. Um, it basically the gamma ray just like turns into a positron. I've got a little you... bit on this. Um, it's called the, it's called pair production. Um, so basically this relies on the phenomenon that when you get into very energetic particles, mass is energy and energy is mass. They're the same thing. It's just a matter of how it's stored. So when you have a gamma ray, which is pure energy, it can create two massive particles. Um, certain requirements have to be met. The re there's a reason it's an electron and a positron and not any other pair of particles. But yeah, the positron is sort of generated spontaneously from the gamma ray, which splits into a pair of particles spontaneously. Um, yeah, again, it's called pair production and is a pretty wild phenomenon in quantum mechanics that relies on energy and mass being interchangeable. And it's 
why we only really see this for gamma rays because you have to have a lot of energy in order to create the mass of an elect even just an electron. Yeah, and to make things even weirder, um, the positron and an electron will eventually find oppositely charged particles, they'll collide and they'll just annihilate. Their mass will be, oops, sorry. <coughs> Their mass will just turn into pure energy, um, which will have, um, which will still be a gamma ray, but um, will have less energy than the original gamma ray. Um, so now we have another gamma ray, and the process just starts over and repeats um, until eventually the gamma ray can no longer pair produce. Um, so the telescopes on the ground I just look for the blue light from the Cherenkov effect. Um, and you might be wondering, well, why don't I see blue light when I look up at the sky at night? So these flashes last for about 10 nanoseconds. So that's 0 0.0000001 seconds, which is way, way too small for, or it's too short of a time for your eyes to register it. Okay, so Obviously, these are some expensive and quite advanced systems that we're using to look at gamma rays. So what can we learn? So gamma rays, unlike most other types of radiation, um, they can't be emitted thermally. Uh, they're so energetic that there's nothing in the known universe that's hot enough to just produce them through thermal radiation. So they can only be produced in conditions such as high magnetic and electric fields, shock waves and explosions. And these conditions occur, for example, in the jets of active galaxies, around neutron stars, and in cataclysmic explosions like supernovas and kilonova. And they're often the only window into these exciting phenomena, which can reveal new physics to us. Uh, so with that, I think we're gonna open up the floor to questions. Anna, I think you're in charge of questions. I am not seeing any in the chat currently. So yeah, feel free everyone if you have any questions about the presentation, um, the activity that we have attached, hopefully you could complete that while you were following along. Um, so Caleb is asking actually, why do these explosions release gamma rays and not some other form of energy or matter? Well, they do, um, they very much do. We see supernova in I think all wavelengths of light, they release a ton of energy. It's just that the special conditions are met for gamma rays to be generated as well. Gamma rays are also very energetic. So they can get, the way it works out, gamma rays can get through stuff that other um, types of radiation can't get through. So sometimes gamma rays are all we can see from an event because other types of radiation were blocked for various reasons. Anybody else? Don't be shy. All right, Caleb actually has another question. Thanks, Caleb, for asking all of these great questions. He said, could Cherenkov red radiation be a different color? I don't know. Um, to be honest, I'm not quite sure. I mean, it's always blue when we look at it around um, nuclear reactors. So I don't know if there's something special about that energy. And do you have any ideas? I'm not as familiar with the Trenkov process as you are actually. Um, 
my guess would be that there's something about that energy that is useful. I believe actually some trick of radiation is in UV. I don't know. I would, I would think that it would have to do with the difference between the, um, the positron and electron, the, their speed and the local speed of light. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's a very good question. Definitely. And now Daniel is wondering, um, does the Trankov detection photons or about them, do they come from the same direction as the original gamma ray? This is where we get cones, I believe. Yeah, and that's actually kind of a complex question. Um, I'm not sure exactly the physics of this, but we end up with a cone of light on on the ground, on our um, on our telescope on the ground. And those cones can be, they're kind of like angled um, in a certain way that points back to where on the sky the gamma ray came from. So it's not, it's not like a point of light on the ground. It's more of like a, a circle, an oval on the detector. I believe it has to do with conservation of momentum, but that's all I've got for you. I know that when we see these in our telescopes, they are never as clear cut as you'd like them to be. Yeah, that's true. There's also a lot of fun stuff that comes up in the analysis uh, because actually cosmic rays do the same thing when they enter the atmosphere. Um, so there's lots of fun um, coding and analysis uh, that goes into separating the cosmic ray generated events from the um, gamma ray ones because cosmic rays are charged so they get bent all out of shape by the magnetic field of the earth. So basically we can't tell where they came from so we don't really care about them. So we, we want to throw them out of our sample. Yeah, I, we probably already discussed cosmic rays or charged particles coming from outer space, which are also super cool. They're an important part of multi-messenger astronomy because you can look at um, light as well as particles. So multi-messenger astronomy using many different w ways of detecting the same source, which means you get to learn more about that source, like we showed you with the Crab Nebula. That's awesome. And then do we get more information from direct detection of gamma rays or indirect detection? Do they mean like space-based versus ground-based? Oh, Caleb, if you, yeah, if you would want to clarify that question too, um, I can always move on to a different one and get clarification on that. Um, Mike was wondering, given our atmosphere um, protects us from typical gamma irradiation from different events, are there any events so powerful that this would not be the case? <laughs> I believe you're getting into the gamma ray burst apocalypse scenario. Um, yes, theoretically, if a gamma ray burst or other source detonated as it were close enough to us, it would be um, catastrophic for a variety of reasons. So I guess theoretically, yes, but it's not something we really need it would be um, such, a, such an insanely catastrophic event that that would not be the first thing we worry about. Um, yeah, the atmosphere keeps us safe in that particular way. And then to clarify Caleb's question, he was um, meaning ground-based versus space-based. I don't know because I know, um, so for example, the telescopes on the ground, they're actually arrays. So they're usually, I believe, I know Veritas has four telescopes, some have more, but on the ground, we need multiple images of that, um, the light shower on the ground to figure out where it came from. So I guess maybe, um, but yeah, not entirely sure there. I would say they probably give us like the same amount of information. They're probably value, I would say they're valuable for different studies. Um, a space telescope can move more quickly. So the SWIFT mission, which looks for gamma ray bursts, it's in space, so it can you know, get on that gamma ray burst right away as fast as possible. And meanwhile, a telescope, a, a ground-based telescope and observatory, um, we're stu Anna and I study blazars and we use Veritas for that. So, you know, a steady source could definitely maybe almost certainly um, Ground-based 
telescope is a little bit less work than getting something up into space. There's like different, I'd say there's different science benefits as well as different just regular like money benefits to each one. Um, space-based telescope is small, but you also have to get it up into space. And because you have to get it up into space, like it, it's expensive, it's hard. Ground-based telescope is big, but also it's on the ground, which we appreciate. Um, but it all, you know, it also requires its own, you know, infusion of technology and telescopes regularly go out of date. So I would say that it's probably different source, different strokes for different folks, both, um, both provide us with lots of useful information. And another question uh, to follow that with telescopes, if a telescope can see so far away and there are so many things going on in space, how are we able to see such a large distance with such detail? Wouldn't things block the view? Um, part of this is what I was saying about how gamma rays can get through stuff that other um, wavelengths of light can't. Um, part of it is just that this, there's not that much really out there. If you look at the sky, most of it is just kind of plain black. And there's things are just not, there's just not that much of a density of stuff. So yeah, basically we can see outside the galaxy and all this stuff because there's just not that much in the way. Um, that said, if you ever see a diagram of like, you know, all known galaxies, how far away they are from us, you'll see this sort of wedge where there's nothing, which is called the zone of avoidance, which is a very dramatic name, basically saying that we cannot see through the disk of the Milky Way. And so there is a section of the sky that we cannot observe in certain ways because the disk of the Milky Way gets in the way. So yeah, sometimes gamma rays can't get through that. Not even gamma rays can get through the disk of the Milky Way. <laughs> Daniel is asking, are supernova, supernova explosions energetic enough to create gamma rays? Yes, definitely. And I did not, this was part of the presentation that I was struggling to do. Can you go into like how, do you know how they're created in supernova explosions? Sort of, generally I have the gist of it. Um, okay, so what happens in a supernova is that all of the material of the star, which has been, which throughout the life of the star has been held away from the core, suddenly gravity is trying to pull it all in all together all at once. So this material starts falling in towards the dense core of the star very, very fast. However, the problem is once it gets to that dense core, there's nowhere for it to go. So it ricochets off with intense speed. And the first, you know, the first sort of layer will hit the, um, <clears throat> hit the core first and then bounce back. And it creates this shock wave, which propagates through the rest of the material. And that shock wave sets various processes in motion um, based on, among other things, the magnetic fields that are present, um, something called thermal Plumstrahlung, which is a German word for breaking radiation, which has to do with the like charged particles interacting in a plasma situation. And these sort of this incredibly fast, powerful shock wave that is spreading out will interact with the um, other medium of the, the other like particles in the star, these charged particles in the magnetic fields to create gamma radiation. Um, I can go into more detail about synchrotron and bremsstrahlung if you want, because this is what I did my senior thesis on, but um, very, it gets very technical very fast. So yeah. Um, Supernovae do can and do create gamma rays um, through mostly the shockwave process. Awesome questions. Um, I guess we can wrap up too if there are no other um, questions in the chat. Yeah, Mimo couple minutes to get the last ones out. I type worse under pressure, so.
So there's there's actually one final question from my brother who's texting me because he can't figure out the chat feature. Um, he, he's asking if the Hulk got hit by gamma rays and I, I believe that is the, the story that um, the Hulk was exposed to gamma ray radiation and got very large and very green and very angry. Um, yes, that's the story. That is the story, yes. Don't do it yes. yourself. If you're exposed to that much gamma radiation, you'll die. You'll die, yeah, so don't do it, yeah. <laughs> That's one of my favorite scientific um, techno babbles, as it were. <laughs> he was exposed to gamma rays. I'm like, he would have just died. Yeah. But he didn't. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think that's awesome. time. Yeah, thank you guys for all of your great questions and for tuning in tonight. Sorry about the technical difficulties at the beginning, but we hope that you all enjoyed the presentation and that you stay safe and healthy um, going into the holiday season. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Bye. everybody. Bye.